Hello, this is the digital game design class from Tinker and Create. My name is Doug Teppi, and today I'm going to take you on an exploration of Unreal Engine. We're going to learn about the basic settings and controls of Unreal Engine. We're going to mess around with the settings and make them fun. And then we're going to start creating our very basic first level for our running style game. So you ready to start tinkering? Let's go. Bringing this up here. This is the Epic Games Launcher main page for Unreal Engine. You will see here up on the top that we have a bunch of choices for where we can go. There's the Learn, there's the Marketplace, and then there is the Library here. The Library is the one that we want. So we will click on Library and we will choose which engine version we want. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, version 20 here and version 24. I'm going to be using version 24 because it is the latest version. So I click on launch. And you will see the splash page here and my face again. Hello. My name is Doug Teppi, by the way, again, for this new stream that we are trying to go through. My name is Doug Teppi, and this is the Tinker and Create class on digital game design. I'll be going over today on how to do the very basics of game design using Unreal Engine. So I'm going to just push this over to the side. We say select or create new project. This is the new version that is being used for Unreal Engine version 24. It includes all sorts of extra information, such as whether or not we're producing this uh, for film or live events, architecture, engineering, and construction, automotive product design and manufacturing. But of course, we're designing a game today. So we will click on games here on top. Once you have games selected, it will ask you what kind of template you wish to make. So taking a look through the template here, you'll see that there's a bunch of different templates that we can choose from, including a blank template. If you've already have an idea of what kind of game you want to make and you don't want to bother with Unreal's templates, that's totally fine. I do recommend browsing through the templates on your own time though. There's a lot of really great games that are built into them, even if they're just simple templates, such as this rolling game here, where you have a little marble that you can roll around in a cool little arena and knock over blocks and things. There's also the vehicle template and the advanced vehicle template, both of which are also fun to explore. You'll see in the little preview picture for the uh, advanced template that there are ramps and all sorts of fun obstacles that you can have your advanced vehicle drive over. So that's a lot of fun to explore. But for purposes of our game, we're going to be making an endless runner in the style of the games that I had mentioned last week, such as Temple Run or uh, the other game Run. So in that case, it would be a third person style game, referring to the fact that the camera is going to be over the shoulder of our third of our person. This is why they call it a third person instead of the first person view where you're looking from behind the eyes of the actual character. In this case, we would actually be looking over the shoulder of the Unreal robot. So Epic Games has been kind enough to give us a lot of free resources. This particular resource is the Epic Games robot and, uh, or excuse me, the Unreal robot. And so it has a bunch of simple animations for jumping, climbing, running that we can use um, that are totally free. Now, of course, there are a lot of other animations that are available on the marketplace that are not free. So if you ever have the desire to do anything more complicated than what the Unreal uh, robot does, then you'll have to look into that later. But we'll go into some of the more details about importing other people's artwork and animations and the like later. For now, at least, for getting used to the overall Unreal uh, templates here, we're going to start with the third person, and then we're going to click on Next. And then here it's going to ask us what kind of project settings we want. So starting in the upper left corner here, it's going to ask us if we want to create this in Blueprint or C++. C++ is a programming language that even among professional programmers, it can be very frustrating to use at times. Uh, it was actually replaced by a more recent version called C Sharp, which a lot of programmers generally prefer. Um, but C++ is a bit difficult. That is what Unreal is actually based on. Don't worry, we're not going to be doing a very complicated programming language, though. They also provide for us a programming language called Blueprint, which is created by Epic Games specifically for Unreal. It is a uh, visual programming language, so it works like Scratch 
or um, other things that people might have actually gotten familiar with through the local school system. So it has, for example, little boxes and the like that you can drag around to do all of your programming for your game. So we'll see an example of that as we work on this. But for now, make sure you select Blueprint in the first one. The second one here is asking what kind of performance we want to have for our game, whether we want it to be maximum quality or scalable 2D or 3D. Now, for most desktop computers, particularly if you have a computer that has uh, eight gigabytes of memory, or excuse me, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, uh, as well as a graphics card, a separate graphics card, you can get away with using maximum quality. If you're using a laptop, or if your computer has only eight gigabytes of memory, or if you just don't even know the answer to that question, I would recommend choosing scalable 2D or 3D because Unreal Engine can be very intense on computers and you don't wanna be draining your battery on your laptop if for some reason you accidentally selected maximum quality. So my computer is a desktop and it can handle it. So I'm gonna choose maximum quality for now. The next choice here is whether or not we want to have ray tracing done real time while we're editing our, uh, our game in the Unreal Editor. In this case, ray tracing is one of the more new things that was created by um, video card manufacturers to simulate the very subtle effects that light creates, such as when, for example, you see light reflecting off of a, uh, a glass window back towards you so you can see through the window, but you still see the light reflecting back towards you at the same time. That is one of those effects that is made possible by ray tracing. Uh, but again, it's one of those things that's gonna be very intense if your computer doesn't necessarily have the capabilities for it. In my case, uh, although as I was mentioning, my computer can handle maximum quality, my computer cannot handle ray tracing. It's only some of the most recent uh, it's only for the most recent uh, graphics cards that are on the market. So uh, yeah, someone was wondering why there's a box around my head. This is how I get around the problem where I can share my screen, but still try to make sure that you can see my face while I'm talking. So I actually just have my camera app over here on the side so you can still see me chatting without necessarily having it screw up the uh, shared screen feed. So. This way you can at least see my face. Hi guys. So still looking over here at our project settings, we'll go full screen in just a moment. I'm gonna go on over here to the next on the upper right side where it's asking if I want to create this on a desktop or console, or if I want to make it on a mobile or a tablet. So the main question is, is actually what kind of screen we're making. If it's widescreen, like on a desktop or a console, or if it is tall, like a well, like a cell phone. So if it is like a cell phone, this is where you would actually try and choose how you want your game to appear. If you're making a mobile game and you want to try and uh, make it big on the Apple Store or in the Google Play Store, then uh, you can give that a try. But for now, I'm making my game for my desktop computer. Um, mind you, of course, when it says console, it's referring to all the major consoles out there, such as PlayStation or Xbox and the like. So you can actually make your game for those as well. And then the last question it asks is if you want to make it with starter content or not. So Unreal uh, comes with a lot of free assets included in the starter content, a lot of really great textures of rocks and grass and other things that are very, very handy for us to use to make our very first game. Now, eventually, of course, yes, you might want to actually create your own. And I'll even show you how you can create your own and include it in Unreal. But with these free assets, it gives us a good way to start so we can get off the ground running and start creating our game. So make sure you say with starter content. The only reason you might say with no starter content is if you wanna try and save your disk space because you don't wanna have all that extra stuff copied over. Lastly, down here at the bottom, it's gonna ask you the location you wish to place it on your computer and what the name of your project is going to be. So in this case, it starts out saying my project, uh, you can name this whatever you want. Uh, even calling it your runner game and the like can also work. I would call mine runner, but I already had my other game that I featured in last week's live stream uh, that is also called runner. So just for purposes of showing you how Unreal works, I'm just gonna leave this called my project. So you'll notice that when it says my project, the M and the P are both capitalized. This is a programming technique of typing called camelback, referring to the actual bumps on the capital letters. 
So those bumps on the capital letters are called camelback, and it is a way of separating out two words. You're going to see that if I try and put a space in here, Unreal is going to come up with this big red warning saying, you can't actually put a space in there. Spaces aren't allowed in Unreal Engine. So instead, we will use the camelback style to separate two words. Now, Unreal is very clever, though. It can recognize when I use the camelback style and treat them as separate words anyways. And so you'll actually see this every time that we use camelback throughout Unreal Engine that you will see them actually separated in the menus and the like as separate words. Very handy like that. Once you have all this selected, we click Create Project, and it's going to be creating it for the first time, including copying over all the assets to make sure that you can actually start with the template that they provided. If this is your first time loading the third-person template, for example, it might actually show a little message in the lower corner asking you, or excuse me, telling you that it is compiling the shaders. So what the shaders are is basically all the calculations saying where light should reflect off of a particular object. It only has to do that once. So once you load your project the second time, it should go a lot faster. You also might get a notice from Windows saying, asking for permission to have it communicate over the network or whether or not it has permission to uh, just make changes on your computer. Of course, you'll want to say yes to those and to give it permission to communicate over the network. Um, you can deny it to go over the network. It does use some tools though to actually make the process run faster that run in the cloud. Uh, so cloud meaning, of course, it uses other computers all across the world to try and help calculate your project. Um, but again, we're just making a simple at-home project. So you don't actually need to grant it access to the internet if you don't want it. Um, using up all of your computer's bandwidth. So uh, taking a look here now, I seem to have zoomed outside my screen. We're gonna take a look over the template here. This is the third person template. And you can take a look around the screen. The way to look around the screen is you use the right mouse button on your mouse and you click and hold it while you take a look around. So that will actually take our editor camera and have the editor camera look around as you drag your mouse around. Now to actually go forwards and backwards at this point, you'll use the WASD keys to fly our editor camera backwards and forwards. So for those of you who might be familiar with using the WASD keys from other video games, such as Minecraft, I think Minecraft uses the WASD keys, this will be familiar to you, but it's just a very comfortable way for you to place your hands onto the keyboard so that way you're middle finger will be right on the W key and the A and the D keys will be where your ring finger and your pointer finger will be. So that way, once I click on the right mouse button to look around and then I press the W key, I'll fly inwards and I press the S key, I fly backwards. The A and the D keys will strafe back and forth. And of course, I can still use the mouse while I'm still holding down the right mouse button the whole time. I can still use the mouse to look around as I fly around. So I can use this to fly up into the air, look down at my game level, zoom in, and get my editor camera to see all sorts of different angles of my project just by using the WASD keys. So looking in right here, here is the Unreal Robot. You will see the Unreal Robot is here with a camera floating right behind it. So Unreal is very handy like this. They will actually literally show you where the cameras are that you use in your level. So in this case, since this is a third person style game, the camera follows along behind our robot as our robot will go through the level. So let's actually see how our game actually plays right now with the basic template. Looking right along the top of our viewport here, you'll see all sorts of different buttons, but the one that I want to use right now is the play button. When you press the play button, we will actually start the game. Make sure you click on the viewport window though, because it might think you're still trying to use some of the other buttons in the editor. So click on the viewport window and then you can actually be in the game. And now I'm actually controlling the game camera now with the mouse. And then the same controls work as before. You can use WASD to have our guy run around. And you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard, if your keyboard happens to have them, to work the camera. So this can be a way with the arrow keys. I can use the arrow keys to go back and forth with the camera, 
or the WASD keys to have them go back and forth without the camera. But go ahead and experiment with that a little bit. When you're using WASD, you will notice that your thumb happens to be perfectly positioned right above the space bar. This is, of course, intentional because the space bar is how we jump. So as you can see, the Unreal robot here has an animation for jumping. He jumps up in the air and he lands. And so we can jump around through our level here and take a look at things. Now, of course, this is just a template. There's not much to it. All we have here is the actual title written on the floor and these four walls. Not much to go with, but we will start messing around with this and breaking things. And it can be part of how we can have some fun while still learning how to work with our game. So while you're play testing your game, you will run around using the WSD keys. When you are done, press the escape key or the ESC key that usually on most keyboards is in the upper left hand corner. When you press the escape key, it will take you back to the beginning of your level. In this case, the beginning of my level is right next to where our third person robot is and the camera again. So this is actually kind of a handy way to get back to the beginning every single time you go through your game. Let's say, for example, I got lost. What if I flew straight up into the air and away from my game world and I'm looking around and I say, oh, I can't figure out where I am. Where did my game world go? I don't know where it is. Just press the play button, then press escape, and you'll go right back to where you were playing. It's a very handy way to just get right back to the beginning again, so that way you don't get lost. So press play and escape, and every time you go back to the beginning. All right, taking a look around here in the rest of the interface, you will see here that we have uh, ways that we can click on all the different objects by here, uh, around here by using the left mouse click. So when you click on any object around here, you will see that it appears that these arrows appear, these blue, green, and red arrows. You'll see that even the blue, green, and red arrows will appear on our robot here as well, as well as the frame, the wireframe that surrounds the robot. So the wireframe that surrounds the robot is actually our collision capsule. So basically, anytime we run into a wall, it's actually not the feet or the arms that are touching the wall. That's just the animation. What literally is touching the wall is actually the capsule. So that's why the capsule is there. So that way you have an idea of how big it is. And then there's this red line showing how the camera is attached to the capsule. In this case, the camera, uh, the big red line is referred to as a boom, which is the same thing that they call it in the, video, in the uh, movie industry. Anytime you have a camera attached to a long boom is how you get it to swing around and do all sorts of cool special effects. So we even have a boom here attaching our camera to our Unreal robot. Pretty cool. So let's not mess with the robot quite yet. Let's just find this object right over here. This particular object right here is a nice little cube. We can then use our arrows to grab it and drag it around. You'll see that as you hover over the arrows, they turn a bright yellow color. You can click on the arrow with the left mouse button to pull it up or to pull it over to the side. Now, after I move this, you're gonna notice here in the upper corner, it says lighting needs to be rebuilt. And funny thing too, there's this shadow here on the floor where it used to be, even though there's another shadow that moved. So of course, Unreal to make sure that it doesn't spend too much time in your processor trying to calculate exactly how the light is shining and how the light is reflecting off of every single surface. It will not actually try and figure out the lighting every time you make a change. It will only figure out the lighting after you press the build button up here. Don't click it now, because if you click on the build button now, it will take a minute or two just for it to do all the calculations as to how the light shines on everything. So this is why we have this little black patch of shadow on the floor, even though I move my object around, is because it calculated where the shadow should be before, but I haven't recalculated it. I haven't rebuilt it. So for the time being, we're just going to ignore the lighting needs to be rebuilt sign over here because we are going to make a lot more changes before we're done here. So I can drag my cube around by grabbing onto the different arrows, or I can even grab the little ball that's right in the middle of them and move it on all the directions. 
Now these colors are actually the same across any sort of 3D editor you might be familiar with. So if you're, you've ever used AutoCAD before or Blender or any other 3D tool, they always use these same colors. Blue is always referring to the up-down scale or the Z axis. Red always refers to the x-axis or the forward and backward. And green always stands for the y-axis, which is the side to side. So even if you get familiar with this here, you'll keep on seeing these same colors used all the time for any kind of 3D editing tool. All right, so now we know how to grab an object and move it around. And of course, you can do this with anything. If you're messing around with your particular project, you can move the walls. And now you have a big open wall there on the side. Have fun with it. Mess around with it. If you make a change to something and you say, whoops, I didn't actually mean to do that, go back. Well, the same undo tools that work in other programs will also work here. You press Control Z to undo what you did. And you can keep on pressing Control Z several times to keep on going back. So if I keep on pressing Control Z, you'll see that my little cube here gets right back onto the floor and the little message about the lighting has disappeared. Okay, fair enough. So Control Z is how you undo. And if you want to redo, then you would just press Control Y. So redo or undo is Control Z and Control Y. All right, so I pulled up my little cube here and I've moved around a little bit. Let's see if we can mess around with a little bit more. Up here in our viewport, you will see these three buttons. The first button is for translating objects, which is what we're doing right now. We are translating an object or moving it around in the space. The next button after it is the rotate objects. So when you rotate objects, you will see wheels go around each of the three axes that I mentioned before. So the blue wheel now means that you're rotating around the z-axis. This is also in aviation terms called the yaw rotation. So rotating around the middle. When we rotate on the x-axis, which is the red wheel here, this is often referred to as the roll meaning we are rolling from side to side. And then when you roll on the Y axis, excuse me, when you grab the wheel on the Y axis, you're changing its pitch. So whether it's pointing up or down is its pitch. And these are the same terms that they use even in the aviation industry for flying airplanes and the like. You will have roll, pitch, and yaw when describing how you're rotating something. So you can mess around with that a little bit, rotate your object. The third button up here is our scale button. So to actually scale an object, you have the same three colors again. And what you can do is you can then stretch out your objects upon one of those axes. So in the case of my blue axes here, I am dragging it out. I can also grab the middle one and make it larger or smaller along all three axes at the same time. So now I've got this big block kind of floating here in my game world. And you'll see that even my runner can run up into it and get stuck in it. So lots of cool possibilities for dragging things around and changing how they look. Again, the same thing works for any other object around here, even the floor. So do be careful about changing your floor. If I switch over here to my translate tool and I drag the floor off so it is gone and I start playing the game, the first thing that's going to happen is my runner will fall straight through the floor and then disappear because he's not allowed to far, fall too far. So of course that doesn't work. I wanna bring the floor back. So I'm gonna control Z to bring the floor back. Now I have the floor to actually stand on. All right, pressing escape again and I am back out here. If you're just joining us, I just wanted to thank you again for coming. My name is Doug Teppi and this is the first class, an introduction to uh, game design using the Unreal Engine. Thank you for coming. I hope you're having fun so far. So far, we have gone over the very basics of how to grab objects, how to move them around. We've also learned how to test our level and what some of the uh, big red words mean when they appear on the screen, such as lighting needs to be rebuilt. So going on now, we're going to see if we can explore some more parts of the very basics of our third person template here. So I said we would come back to our robot. Here's our robot again when I click on him you will see that he is attached to the camera. So some of those same tools will still work here. 
I can grab him, drag him back, and choose, for example, a different starting location for my game. So when I click play now, he will appear on the other side. You can even try and break this by rotating it. Now, some of you might notice too, you hear my keyboard clicking as I go along. The W, E, and R keys allow you to quickly switch in between the three settings of scaling, rotation, and translation. So bringing up the rotation here, I could rotate him so he's facing straight down. Um, seems like I've broken the game now though. That's actually kind of funny. I've never done this before. He's just twirling around. That's hilarious. Okay. But yeah, we, we don't necessarily want to make that game, at least not yet. So I'm going to do control Z. And of course, too, you can even scale him so that he is a giant. Now be careful. You're going to see that he's sinking inside the floor here. This does have unpredictable results. Usually it will try and get him to stand upon the floor. So even if he's sunk inside the floor, the game will say, oops, he's sunk inside the floor, bounce him up to the next available object. But clearly you can also see here now that unfortunately the camera is now positioned way too close. So making him huge isn't really gonna work in this instance either. So yeah, you can rescale our little guy here. Now, some of the other things you will notice as you are clicking around through your objects is over here on the right side of the screen is our world outliner. The world outliner shows everything that happens to exist in the world at the time. For example, here's my cube mesh listed right here. When I click on the Unreal Robot over here, you will see it says third person character listed over here on our world outliner. You can also use the outliner to find other objects. Now, mind you, everything around here is clickable. So for example, there is the lighting here. The reflection capture, which is how it calculates how light reflects off of objects. So you get this kind of glow between the walls here. The reflection capture actually calculates how that occurs. There is even the sky that can be clicked on. When you click on sky here, you will see that over on the side, it's referring to the sky sphere blueprint. So the sky itself, is an object that we can move around and change. Now, of course, the catch is though, it is called the sky sphere for a reason. It is huge enough to fill up the entire level. So right now, moving it around a little bit isn't gonna change much because it is so huge. If I just move it a little bit, you're not really gonna see much of any difference. But this is where the clouds are painted where the sun is painted, and you can even change it so that way even stars and things can show out. So as you can see, the clouds are moving gently like on a beautiful summer day. Let's see if we can mess with this a little bit. So let's go down. We're gonna click on the sky sphere and below the world outliner here on the right side, you will see the details window right down here. In the details menu, we have all sorts of settings for changing where things are located in our world. But in particular for the sky sphere, it has these extra settings under this default menu right here. The one in particular that is kind of fun to mess with is the cloud speed. So down looking inside our details menu here, in the category of default, there is a section called cloud speed, which right now is set to two. Uh, we can make it look like a hurricane if we type in a much larger number here. Let's type in 100. Okay, wind is going pretty fast now. Let's type in 1,000. Okay, wind's going really fast now. This is getting pretty silly now. I've, of course, have seen students in my class go off and type in a million here. This usually just breaks it and everything turns into a big blur. But you can try and type in the largest numbers and you might see that happen on your computer. It's also possible that you will crash your computer at this point because you're typing in such large numbers. So do be careful about typing in large numbers into this. If for some reason you want to go back, you can use the control Z function or right next to our cloud speed input right here, there's a little yellow arrow pointing back that says back to default. So when I click that, it goes back to a cloud speed of one again. So the clouds are going nice and slow again. So that's kind of cool. 
You can mess with some of the other settings here as well, where, for example, we have cloud opacity. If you want the clouds to be very bright, like it's a cloudy day or something, just keep on cranking up that number. You can crank up the number just by hovering your mouse over it, and you'll see a little back and forth arrow appear. So you can just click and drag it back and forth. And it's the same thing as if you actually typed in the number. So I can make the clouds totally disappear or not. There's also the sun brightness setting. If I just turn the camera straight up, I can crank up the sun so it is very bright. Or I can make it very dim. This might be handy if you were making a video game perhaps where the hero was on a distant planet or something and you wanted your sun to look very dim and far away perhaps. Lots of fun possibilities there. The other thing that I want to point out is in the default section here, there's a little section that says directional light actor and it says light source. So the light source that it's referring to is the very same light source that we saw right here in the middle of our level, the little picture of a sun. So you'll see over here in the world outliner, it is called the light source. And on our little picture of a sun here, you will see an arrow pointing straight down. This is actually referring to which way the lighting for the whole level is coming from. So we can even grab this and rotate it to change where that lighting source is coming from. And you'll see that it will try to approximate the lighting as best it can as I rotate it. You'll see some of the shadows actually will be turned into just a sign that says preview. So it's just trying to do a quick and dirty lighting change, even though I've massively changed the lighting at this point. So now that I've changed my lighting source to come from the side now, I'm gonna look up at the sky sphere, but hey, wait a minute. The sun is still directly in the sky. It didn't seem to actually follow where my lighting source came from. We can actually change that by clicking on our sky sphere again. And down in the default section, there is a little checkbox right on top that says refresh material. So remember, our clouds and the picture of the sun is really just painted on the sphere that is surrounding everything. So that paint job over the whole sphere is called the material. We need to refresh the material because we've changed where the lighting has come from. So we click on refresh material here. And now the sun has been calculated to come from the side now. You'll see that it's turned into kind of a rosy sunset color, which is actually built into the Skysphere blueprint. This is really cool because Unreal gives you this stuff for free. You don't actually have to figure out how to design, design your own sky. Unreal has already given this to us. And of course, the same thing applies if you grab your light source here again and point it straight up in the air. So now the lighting source is coming from underneath everything. I go back to my sky sphere and click on it. And that's just as simple as looking straight up into the sky and clicking on the sky. And then I click on refresh material here. And now you'll see it turns very dark black. Now the stars here are very faint on my screen. So I'm assuming that through the live feed, you probably can't see this because they're very small. But hey, there is a setting down here in our sky sphere blueprint details for star brightness. So I'm gonna crank up that star brightness and now you can probably see it on the live feed. You got some very bright stars up here. So we could even have some fun pretending that maybe I'm on a planet without an atmosphere. So I'll change my cloud opacity to zero, no clouds. And I turn up the brightness of the stars so it's like I'm looking into the galaxy or something. And now, wow, this is kind of cool. It looks like my robot is on another planet now. Very cool stuff. Okay, so uh, that is how we mess around with the sky sphere. And that's how we click on the little robot. That's how we move objects. Just quickly going back to me again. Hello guys, my name is Doug Teffy. And if any of you have just joined in recently, uh, this is the digital game design intro to Unreal Engine class that we are gonna be providing with the Tinkering Create group over the next few weeks, every Thursday at six o'clock PM, hopefully once we've worked out all the kinks of figuring out how, uh, un how uh, Facebook Live works, we'll be able to start immediately at six o'clock instead of going a little bit over. So I see now that it is seven o'clock, I will continue on for another 15 minutes or so. I think that's once we officially got started and I'll show you a few other things you can mess with and Unreal Engine just with the basic template, the third person template that it gives you uh, right from the start. 
So going back and looking at our third person template here again, we've changed around our sky sphere. We've changed around this block. I'm going to press control Z a few times to bring my sun back up to a nice sunny day again, because this makes things a little bit easier to see. All right, so I've got my nice sunny day with lazy clouds going by. Now you might remember at the beginning of the class, I mentioned if you ever get lost, let's say you've flown through the wall and you're far away, I'm still flying away from my game level. Okay, my game level is now far away. And I say, oh goodness gracious, I'm too far away. How do I get back there quickly? Well, one way is to press the play button and then escape and it'll take you right in there. Another way is to press the F key for focus. So look over here in your world outliner for something that you know where it is. So in this case, I'm gonna use the third person character. I click on the third person character here in the world outliner, press F for focus, and it zooms me right back in on my third person character. This works for all objects. So let's say you wanna get a good close look at whatever object you're currently working on. Let's say the staircase here and I press F, we zoom right in on the staircase. This even works with the sky sphere. If you click on the sky sphere and press F, you will see that you are now completely outside the entire sky sphere. So again, the sky sphere itself is huge. So if you find yourself with the sky sphere right in the middle of your screen like this, it will take forever for you to try and fly back inside it again using the right mouse button and the WASD keys. So again, either starting the game and escaping out it's a good way to get back to the beginning, or as I mentioned, clicking on a familiar object over here and pressing F. The F key is a very handy way to bounce back in and find particular things that you're looking for. Uh, let's mess around with some more things on our settings for our runner. So as we looked at with the sky sphere, we were able to change the speed of the wind blowing the clouds. Well, it's the same thing with our robot here. When we click on the Unreal robot here, you will see that the third person character is selected. And down in the details has all the information about where his location is, what his rotation is, and what his scale is. And a couple other settings that don't necessarily apply right now. So instead, if we want to look for a particular setting, uh, you might want to actually go down through the details here to try and find a particular setting that you want to find. For example, the jump setting. In the details here, we can type in jump in the search and it'll show you every single details object that is referred to as jump. In particular, the one I want to mess with here is the jump Z velocity. So when I change jump Z velocity, right now it is set to 600. So let's say I change the jump Z velocity to 2000. When I go up to the gameplay and I press the space bar now, you'll see that I jump way up high and beyond the edge of the walls. Lots of fun possibilities with this. When I escape back out, you'll notice that I have lost the selection of my third person again, so I click on it again. But you'll still see that I am searching for any particular thing called jump. So looking down through here, I can see other jump things such as braking, deceleration, air control. So if we were making a, a skydiving game, perhaps you could have more control over how you fall. One of the important ones that sometimes people often ask me about is how many times you can jump. As we know, a lot of video games, particularly platformer video games, allow you to do a double jump. So just to demonstrate that, I'm gonna change my jump Z velocity back to 600 again. And all the way down here, there is an option for the jump max count. In other words, how many times you can jump in a row. So if I wanted to do a double jump, I would change the jump max count to two. And when I play the game now, if I press the space bar once, he jumps. If I press it twice, he kind of does a double jump in the air. So you can change the jump max count to as high a number as you want. You can do as many double jumps as you want to include. There's also the jump max hold time. Right now it's zero, meaning that if I hold down the jump button, he will still fall back to the ground. But instead I can change this to a higher number, let's say three for three seconds. And when I play the game and I press the space bar, You'll see that he actually will float up in the air as I press and hold the space bar for three seconds until he loses that. 
So this is how you, you can do things such as flying games. Lots of cool possibilities there. Okay, so I had some people asking whether or not we can actually start building it, building our very first game. So right now, looking at this particular level, this is just our third person template level. This is what they already gave us to start with, but this isn't actually our game, and it's got all these other things on it that I don't necessarily want to work with. So to actually start creating your own game level, you will need to actually create your very first game level. So to create that game level, you will go into the upper left-hand corner here, where the file menu is, drop down the file menu and click on new level. When you click on new level, it will give you a couple of different choices, a completely empty level, which means it has nothing in it, it's totally black, a VR basic level, which means it, you can use it for a virtual reality goggles if you happen to have them. I've never actually experimented with that. There's also a time of day level, which gives you a little bit better control, uh, I assume, over the lighting, such as whether it's sunset or daylight. And of course, the default level. So we're just gonna create a default level here. It's then gonna ask me if I want to save my level because I've been changing the basic third person template here. It says, do you want to change the third person example map? Now, if you've made some changes to that that you want to keep, go ahead and click on save selected. I don't wanna bother saving any of my changes. I was just moving things around, for example. So I'll say don't save. All right, so now we are looking at the default level that it has given us. First things first, you wanna make sure that you save your level to begin with. So what you can do then is click in the picture of the disc in the upper part of our viewport, and it will ask you to name your level. So for whatever reason, I don't know why Unreal does this, they often will call levels maps. So in this case, the default name for the level is called a new map. You can call it new level. In my case, I will call it level one because of course we're gonna have multiple levels. No true game can be made without having multiple levels, just like the Mario games, right? So I'm calling this level one and it's gonna be saving in my main content folder. When I click save, I can then go and see where it has been placed down here in my content browser. In my content browser, this is operating in just the same way as Windows folders operate. So I can click on the main content folder right here in the upper part of the content browser. And you will see now this little yellow icon for my level one. This is how I get to the level from now on. If I wanna to get to this level to open it and change it, I'll just double click on level one. And so for now, this is a good place for me to put this. This is where my content is, this is my level one. And now we're looking at the level one map. So looking at this basic map right here, it has given us a lighting source, a skylight, a reflection capture, as well as a player start. When I click play, you'll see that the robot is standing there on the player start location, and there's not much else going on here. I jump off the edge of the world, of course, not much else happens and the world will just fall away behind me. Pressing play again and escape again brings me back up to the top. So this particular little square that I have here right now is actually something I don't want to use. This is what is called a static mesh. So a static mesh is a way for computers to quickly memorize shapes and use them throughout the level. So in this case, this particular shape is always going to be this shape. I can stretch it out using the stretch tools, but you'll notice that as you stretch it out, the picture of the grid that is on top of it stretches out too, because the grid itself was actually supposed to be wrapped around a specific sized object. When I stretch it out, the grid gets stretched out as well. Of course, if I'm making a running style game, I need to have a nice long runway, but I can't just go off and stretch out my runway this way. So instead, I'm going to use some different functions that Unreal has built in for building levels. So the first thing I will do is delete this. I'm gonna press the delete button on my keyboard. It will disappear. Don't bother pressing the play button or else your character will just start falling. Over here in the modes menu, you're gonna to wanna to go down to the menu that is labeled as geometry. 
Now, in this case, when I start out with a box and drag it into my world here, it's going to look kind of like the floor that I had already had before. But in this case, it is no longer a static mesh. It is what's referred to as a brush or a binary space partition, a BSP, meaning that the computer is actually drawing it on the fly every single time instead of being static and never changing. So of course, if I still try and stretch this out, it will get stretched in the way that I don't want. But when I click on my box brush over here, and I go down to the details menu and I click the X to get rid of the jump search I was doing, you'll see down here that I have brush settings that allow me to change its size and shape. When I change these brush settings, this is actually allows me to paint my level. And this is how professional game designers will actually start designing their level when they're trying to figure out the actual gameplay and before they've actually made any of their artwork yet. So with a nice plain square here, I can change my X dimension here in the brush settings to show to be much longer. So let's say if I wanna have a very long runway, I will change my X settings here to 10,000. Now a little side note here, every single measurement in Unreal Engine is measured in centimeters. So when I say something is 10,000 centimeters long, that means it is 100 meters long. This is a nice long runway. To make sure that my starter player actually is in the proper place, I'm gonna to wanna to actually go right up here to the top of my detail settings. And where it says location, I wanna make sure that the location is at zero, zero, and zero. This now brings it into the center of the entire level. And you will see that my starting location is also right there. This way, when I click play, it places my runner on top of my runway here, right in the center. And I can run along my runway. Kind of a nice start. But of course, one problem that we already notice here is, is that our starter player is currently embedded inside of that. So clicking on our box brush again, you'll need to make sure you click on the box brush over in the box in the world outliner here. Because if you click on it in the viewport window, it's actually going to be picking a particular side of the brush. So if I want to pick a particular side of the brush so I can change the material that's on there, I would want to do that. But if I want to change the actual size and location of that, I need to actually click on the box brush itself in the world outliner. And you'll see the brush settings back down here again. So just changing here, my X is at 10,000. My Y will be 500. And my Z will be 20. So 20 centimeters thick, 500 centimeters wide or five meters wide, and 10,000 centimeters long. This makes for a pretty good runway for my runner to run along. Now, I see that we are pretty much running out of time here. So starting next Thursday at six o'clock again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you can start adding obstacles to our runway here. And we can extend our runway and add more shapes and staircases along the runway and to make it more like a game as we go along. That does it for today's class. As always, with anything you do on a computer, make sure you save your work. You can see the icons here for saving and it has a picture of an old fashioned disc in the upper corner. And make sure you save everything down in the content browser. Of course, it will also ask you if you want to save things when you click the X button in your upper corner to close it. So make sure that no matter what you do, you save your work. And I'll see you next week. We'll start off right where we left off. See you then.